So thank you all for coming. We're very excited to be hosting this event. Um, just FYI for those on Zoom and for those here. So we had 1,000 people register, which is a new record for us. Um, so really, really happy with the turnout. Um, and uh, thank you, Meta, for hosting us. So please, um, Guy will uh, kick us off, Guy from Meta. Hi, good morning. No, no need for that. <laughs> So uh, good morning, everyone. We are really happy to have you this morning with us uh, at our office. So I don't know a lot about AI, so I'm not going to steal much of your time. Don't worry. I just want to say two uh, small things before we kick off. So we have a big AI for us, for Meta, right? It serves ads every day. And I want to give you a small tip for companies who have AI and one day are going to hire people that are going to also talk to customers and try to explain your AI and not just build it. So what we found out over the years that our best sales people, the best people to do business for us, are actually ones that used to build AI in their past. And now what they do is explain AI so they used to build models, and now they explain models. Many times we see companies that have amazing back-end technology, but whenever it comes to business, they're saying, now I'm going to bring this suit person uh, who knows how to sell stuff. For us, it didn't work. Uh, for us, we understood that whenever we want people to really understand our AI, for startups that we work with to beat their corporates, competitors, everywhere in, everywhere in the world, the people we hire, the people who should talk to them, are people who used to be data scientists and to build the models themselves. So one tip, when you come to hire people, we're going to explain the amazing technologies that you're about to build or building already. Please make sure that these are not just salespeople, but people who can also really understand what you're building and simplify it to clients. So that's one thing. The second thing, I want to say one word about this office. So Meta has offices all around the world. This is the only office worldwide that has the mandate from the company to work with startups in all stages, from a couple of entrepreneurs in the garage till uh, Wix or Monday, which we call startups, because they still care about ROI and churn and LTV, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is what our office does day and night. In order to do it in the right way, um, and the right way is to generate as many unicorns out of Israel, as many companies who can actually beat their competitors uh, all over the world, uh, we understood that one really important component is to have amazing partners like the VCs in Israel as close friends of ours, because everyone here shares the same interest. So the startups and the founders, well, they want to be, build a huge company. We want them to build a huge company as well, because if they build a huge company and they use us as a growth engine, we will grow as well. And guess what? Their investors uh, want them to be a huge company as well. So it's like alignment of interest between the companies, the VCs, and the platform, uh, us in, our case, in this case. So I just wanted to say thank you so much for Entry Capital, for the huge partnership throughout the years and for uh, choosing us to host this event. Uh, and I wish everyone an amazing day and I'm gonna pass it over to Neil. Thank you. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. I'm gonna um, call our panelists, tell them thank you give a little bit of a uh, give a little bit of context about why we're here and uh, why we're hosting this event and then start bombing them with questions all right so uh, first um, professor Yoav Shom, um, I'd like to welcome you on stage um, Yoav has been a, a professor in computer science in Stanford Stanford uh, University and co-CEO co-founder of um, AI 21 labs um, a company that built Wartune, which I'm a happy paying customer. Um, so you have come, can you please come here on stage? Uh, thank you for, thank you for being with us. Uh, next one is Dr. Tali Dekel. 
Tali is primarily a researcher in uh, mostly in the Weizmann Institute and in Google and um, researching a lot in AI, generative AI, and especially in 3D video and uh, vision. So uh, thank you for coming, Tali. Next, next one is Yair Adato, also Dr. Yair Adato, I think. Um, full disclosure, he is um, the CEO of one of Antra's uh, portfolio companies, Bria AI. They do, um, and here maybe you'll, you'll speak in two words about it, but what they do is uh, give you the possibility to create, vis create and fine-tune visuals with very um, uh, high level of control to the end users. Uh, so, yeah, please join us. And last one, uh, Itamar Friedman. Um, he led a Alibaba's R&D center, center here in Israel and um, recently, really recently, started a new startup, uh, Codium, which um, connects AI and programming and developing work. So um, really, thank you for coming. Come on and join us. <coughs> Guys, thank you. Um, first, a little bit of context of, of why we're here, why we're hosting this event, aside from the technology and the hype, is you know, really cool for everybody. Um, what we realize is there's, um, we come across a lot of founders, um, talented individuals, talented teams that come to us and say, listen, we want to build companies around this thing. We want to we build companies around generative AI. We think it's going to change the world, but we don't really know what to do. And sometimes they even pitch us, and then in the middle of the pitch, they're like, like be honest, what do you think? Do you think that this, this one will last? Do you think it's a, it's a good idea? Um, usually, you don't hear that from founders. And, and we realize that we might be in a very interesting time to um, um, that the, the direction forward is not, not very clear for everyone. And so we decided to gather in this room um, these uh, four experienced, smart uh, people to share with us their knowledge, wisdom, um, and experience. And so, guys, thank you, thank you so much for our, uh, you know, spending the time with us this morning, in the name of the, all the people in the room and those who joined us uh, virtually. So thank you. Um, maybe the first question, and I got them in advance, of course. Um, understand a little bit, you know, the, the general, um, your general thoughts of the hype. So everybody is talking about generative AI. And I think a lot of people are curious, is this just another hype that um, will fail to deliver, like hypes that we saw in the past and can be, you know, choose the one you relate to. It can be drones or uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, the metaverse or, you know, uh, you know, virtual uh, reality and, and things like that? Or are we in the um, first stage of a true revolution, kind of like the iPhone invention moment? And, and how do you know? How do we know? How do we know if, that's, um, if this hype is going to deliver and really going to change the world? So it's a question for all of you, so um, take your turns. And Uh, I think there's a there there. I don't think it's uh, all uh, puff. Uh, I think uh, like with every technology, you need to be realistic about what it does and what it doesn't or doesn't yet do. And um, there's no question in my mind that not only in the future, already now you're seeing applications that weren't possible five or even two years ago. And I think that trend will continue. But you see today limitations to technology that sometimes in the uh, rational, irrational exuberance people overlook. And as they try to transition from uh, demos, which are uh, uh, real demos and very exciting, to, but to applications, uh, they discover sometimes painfully the limitations. And I think if there's a danger, it's a danger that uh, we will rush a little too fast without recognizing limitations and anticipating how fast they will be uh, um, uh, dealt with over time. Yeah, I 
I truly think that this is a huge revolution. At least I can speak to uh, the research side of it. And I can say that from a, as, a research, as, a, as a researcher, I see it as a major breakthrough, at least as big as the deep learning revolution that we had back then in 2015. In terms of visual capabilities that we can gain computationally, this is a new world of you know, possibilities that were basically impossible uh, up until a couple of years ago. And, and I guess you all see it like uh, I think an evident is that my mom calls me with a, a result of a, an a image generated from text, and then you understand that like, this is all over the place. And I don't think it's just a hype. Uh, the way we see that uh, the, the, the super complicated visual concepts that these models can capture is a true uh, revolution in my mind, at least from a research perspe perspective. I cannot speak too much on the product side, though. For, for me, it's two different questions, if there is a hype and if it's going to change the world. It's hype. Everybody, everybody uh, play with that, everybody uh, tried it, everybody knows about it. Um, and this is a very uh, magical uh, technology. It's, it's work like a magic. I ask raccoon in space and I get a raccoon in space. And it's uh, make the hype even higher. Having said that, this technology, for my opinion, I share the opinion of, of my colleagues here, are going to change the world completely. I think that it's going to change the way we think about data in general, not only images, not only text, not only code. And I think that the next generation where we'll, we will we'll start to see this technology, not on the very obvious uh, uh, elements, will be even more interested than what we, we see today. So hype, yes, change the world, also yes. First of all, uh, it's great to sit with uh, these great people here and all of you. So I think it's a bit wrong to put like a, do a cluster of all the hyped topics and then a cluster of all those that are not hyped because it's very specific. Uh, but still, we love to compare between things. So I'll try to do that. For example, uh, compared to the metaverse, I think it forces people to change the way they behave quite immensely. Like you need to <laughs> put something on your face, etc. While I think like generative models, or if you like, I'll I'll, I'll say generative AI, and uh, then basically I think it will um, be injected and be used in so many cases and so many applications that we're being used, using, using them today and amplify them. They also create new ones. So I think that technolo the technology is not hyped and it's going to change the world. I think that um, some companies uh, are, might be a bit hyped or some areas might be a bit hyped, but but I think the technology is real and it's going to make uh, big waves. Okay, thank you. So I think we'll, we'll start to dive deeper in, uh, into the field of expertise of each one of, the, of, our, of our guests here today, of the panelists. And, and maybe start with you, Tali. Um, the, when it comes to generative models or generative AI, um, we see uh, many research groups fueling the innovation that later becomes uh, products and, and ideas for companies. And, and so there's a huge involvement of research group, both in the academia and, and in the big tech companies. And, and I'm curious, as someone who's primarily, primarily a researcher, um, if you can give us kind of like, how do you see the lay of the land uh, in terms of the research activity right now? And, and what do you think are the next big projects, the breakthroughs that will happen um, not right now, but let's say two, three, or four years from today. Yeah, so maybe before speaking uh, specifically about generative AI, I think it is important to say that there is a paradigm shift, a big one, that is happening in the field of computer vision and AI. If like a few years ago, uh, we, uh, all the efforts were uh, to build these task-specific models. We were trying to solve visual recognition, so we gather data for visual recognition, we train the model for uh, uh, visual recognition, and these were the efforts. And now we are really seeing this paradigm shift where we are moving to what is called foundation models, which are huge billion parameters models that are trained in a uh, uh, self-supervised manner without having human labels. And they, the goal of these models is not to learn this specific task, is to learn universal 
representation about the world that could be used for many different tasks. So we're really seeing uh, self-supervised learning uh, dramatically scaling up and uh, lots of exciting developments in, in these areas. And uh, generative AI, I think, is a particular example uh, from these models, these foundation models that were trained on massive amount of uh, data without labels, and you see the, the capabilities emerge there um, without explicitly um, uh, requiring, uh, requiring them, which is quite amazing. Uh, and now when it comes comes to generative AI research, uh, there is an obvious difference between research that could be applied in industry and research that could be applied in pure uh, academic institute. Uh, I think it's a real problem that is happening now that uh, industry, uh, the big companies, hold uh, the, the models, the foundation models, and um, uh, researchers in academia don't have uh, free access to, to these uh, models and are not able to explore them uh, the same way uh, the big companies uh, can. So we see efforts in industry for building and advancing these foundation models, training them on more data, scaling them up. And we see efforts in research specifically uh, in generative AI to um, build on top of these uh, foundation models. So and this could, uh, could have many different uh, routes and direction. I specifically uh, think that in terms of generative AI, uh, gaining control over the generated content, being able to uh, provide users with intuitive tools for editing or content creation, because eventually these foundation models, again, they are not designed for a specific application, they're more um, uh, something that could generate beautiful images out of text, but if you really want to use them for real world applications, you need to be able to adapt them and to control them and to understand them and so on. Um, so I think uh, in terms of the other part of the question of where this is all going, I think we, uh, we should expect to see um, more uh, advancement in the creation or development of foundation models. I think videos is a huge one. Um, videos have always been much more challenging, uh, just in terms com computationally, but not just, just the complexity of video data is far, far, far more complex than images. And it requires, I think, to rethink uh, some of the um, uh, way we build uh, neural networks, how we design our models, and so on. And it requires also a major um, effort in terms of compute and scaling up these foundation models even further. There is also a, a, an issue with data. You don't have that many videos coupled with text that you can train these models on, so you need to be more creative. Uh, but I do expect to see um, uh, a major uh, advancement in, in videos um, uh, in the coming years. Uh, I don't know, being able to generate movies from text and things like that, or coupling vision or generative AI with other modalities in general. Um, yeah. Interesting. Thank you. And maybe uh, that's a good segue to the next question to SK Yoab. Um, so you... It, 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 um, in in AI Twenty One Labs, where uh, you build the Wartune and Wartune Read, and I think there's a, a few other products that that are waiting to be launched soon. Um, you decided to build your own language model, and and basically not use GPT three or any one of those large language models out there. And and I'm curious if you could walk us through the logic behind your strategy, and uh, what were you trying to achieve. And more importantly, like, would you take the same decision today and kind of the, the advice you'd give founders on whether they just need to build the application, like the Wartune, or should they, um, or when should they build their own language model? No, I think it's a very natural, good question. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you our path and our, uh, it, it may not apply uh, broadly, but I'll, 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 I'll share, you know, our, our experience. Um, so... One thing to realize is that we didn't start the company with a goal of building a Wartune. Uh, our mission was to change AI and still is. And our starting kind of position was we thought that deep learning was a necessary component, but not sufficient. We thought that deep learning, the statistical kind of methodology, uh, would 
is now and will continue to be able to identify patterns that we couldn't imagine that it would, but it would never do addition as well as a, you know, a 10-year-old. Uh, so, you know, whether it's Jurassic 1, our model, or GPT, chat GPT, give it, you know, two numbers to add up, it'll do it well. If they're small, if they're big, or out ask to multiply numbers, you'll get garbage. And we have this amazing invention we haven't announced of how to do um, arithmetic. We call it the calculator. It's going to be big. Uh, and so it's an example of a reasoning um, uh, that God didn't put neural nets on Earth to do that. Uh, also to access databases and so on. So that's why we started the company, which means we had to build technology by definition. Uh, now, we, uh, we also didn't just want to be a research lab. Um, we didn't want to be a deep mind uh, for whom we have nothing but admiration, but we really wanted to build a thriving business. And so the question is, what, what business should we be in? And, and it's a long story, but in an odd way, we found ourselves very constrained because most businesses don't require deep technology. If you take our, well, I won't mention names, but companies very successful uh, build as a, build build as AI companies and they have technology that's yay deep and they don't need more than that. Um, so we were limited to a problem that required deep technology and so we set as our goal to change how we read and how we write. You know, one of our slogans is the way we write today is the way a product manager decided in Microsoft in 1980 and the way we read today is the way Gutenberg decided in 1440 with the printing press. And we felt that both experiences can be radically over rethought if you put AI at the core. Um, and so we fell into, initially, almost exactly two years ago, we launched WordTune, and almost exactly a year ago, WordTune Read. Um, and, um, and to do that, uh, we, we had our technology, uh, and we found it very useful because we understood what the technology was good for and where it fell off the cliff. And um, I can tell you that the amount of, alg I'm not speaking about the engineering work, the algorithmic work that went into WordTune, um, less than 50% of that was the training of Jurassic 1, our, our GPT. So we were, by the way, we started by using GPT-3. We were the first users of GPT-3 before it was publicly available. We know OpenAI really well, great company. Um, and we decided for a variety of reasons we should roll our own. So we, um, you know, we, that's why we built the company and we also want to control our own destiny. It served us well. And so we understand where the models break and we can compensate in the product. And conversely, uh, and we have multiple models, you know, Jurassic is just one of them uh, that are informed by our experience of building an app. So it worked well for us. So to answer your second question, in hindsight, we, we do differently know, but this is true for us. Now, your last question is, you know, what should, you know, other people do here? Uh, I don't think there's one right answer. Um, I would say that, so two things. If you're building your own models, you don't have the luxury of building them less than state of the art. Might as well just not start. And it's a big undertaking. It's not just, you know, the algo is more or less commodity, although as you innovate, you know, cutting edge is never commodity. Uh, and the scale of engineering, you know, running a thousand GPUs simultaneously for, you know, four months, it, things break. And uh, so you need to, 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 but if you're set up for that, I think it's, uh, uh, and you need money for it. Uh, and so, uh, so, but it's, you're building a lot of enterprise value if you're doing that. Uh, if you're not doing that, um, then I would s make sure you have deep expertise. Even if people aren't building the model, they could have if they had the resources uh, and the mandate to do it. But that means they can really ask the hard questions. And so when they use and consume the model, they do it intelligently. They... Um, they understand the roadmap, they understand, maybe if you look, for example, at Helm, the recent Stanford uh, benchmark that came out, and by the way, I think they intended this week, but next week to, to, uh, to un uh, release a new, new, new iteration of it, they'll do it on an ongoing basis. Uh, so you'll see the various rankings of the model, understand what rankings, what you get, you get from them, and also take them with a grain of salt. We, I can tell you that we rank highly in the uh, latest uh, iteration. Um, I, I, I encourage you to take that with a grain of salt because 
what you want to do with the models doesn't isn't necessarily reflected in the benchmarks that are there. Just be sophisticated in the consumption. Sorry, that was a long answer. No, that's that's actually fantastic. Thank you. Um, next question is. Uh, yeah. Can I add something? Sure. I, I, I just want to add, it's not only the question of what model to build, it's also a question of timing. When it's the right time to decide that the technology is there and now it's a, a good time to go this, chase this adventure, uh, right? Um, I, I, I would respectively, respectfully disagree. I think the time is always now. Really? This is an area we need to run and stay in place. At any point in time, there are 10 different things we could do that are innovative and move the needle. And it'll never be the right time. I think it's, oh, it's always now the question is which of the various things you could be building is the right thing to build now, in my opinion. Uh, thanks. Um, next question uh, is for you, Yair. Um, as someone who's um, been leading a B2B generative AI company for the last two years, um, I think it's interesting to learn your thoughts and lessons learned about um, go-to-market and sales. And, and I'm curious to know how um, companies, are they actively looking for solutions in that space or is it still considered like a fun toy to play with? And, and how would the level of maturity among your clients uh, would affect your product strategy? Um, several, several good questions. Um, I think that um, um, we, we started a company and uh, what we had in mind is to have a B2B company to sell to businesses and to talk about uh, um, elements, the KPIs like uh, velocity, um, 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 efficiency, independency, how to make the marketeers uh, more efficient and less how to make a, a good visual. So it's a different way to think of a problem. And the first thing that is important is to understand exactly what is the DNA of the company, like, like you mentioned. And if you aim from efficiency, it's different than if you aim from creativity. Uh, I think that over the last two and a half years, um, I, I can see the three different uh, period. In the first one, people simply didn't understand what we want from them. It's like, we don't get it. You, you can just add a red square on the image and maybe it will do the same impact. They didn't get it. Um, in the second uh, period starting a year and a half ago, uh, we show a demo, we show some uh, very early product and people were amazed, like it's blow their mind. We never saw something like that, but we don't know what to do with it. Uh, and even if you explain me what to do with it, none of our clients ask for that. And if, and if somebody asks for that, we don't know how to price it. We don't know how to market in it. We actually don't know what to do with it. It's amazing. We will wait. Uh, so, so that was for a long time. What we see today in the last uh, uh, half a year is that all of the, these uh, companies that uh, uh, um, wait said, okay, okay, now it's the time to start. Maybe it's the same thing that you said. Now it's the time to start. And uh, let's uh, work together and understand how it's going to impact uh, my business, how I'm going to integrate that, how it's going to change the model and the, f the way we think about the world. Um, it's still complicated. It's still tough. And uh, one thing that we always try to say to these companies is don't try to mimic the thing that you do manually. Try to think how it's going to change the way uh, your client is going to engage with your platform. And obviously, this is much harder task to do, but there is much more openness for that. The only thing, the, the another thing that I would add here is that the hype are uh, very confusing the, the client. So you can uh, uh, be at the same meeting when someone said to you, it's a commodity, and somebody else said to you, it's not working. Uh, and, and, and this is from the same team, from the same uh, a client, and you need to explain what is the difference between uh, the ability to generate a, a amazing uh, visual to the ability to generate the visual that you need in a predictable way, in a controllable way, in a way that it will follow your brand guideline, in a way that uh, you will have exactly five fingers and not 4.8 or uh, 5.2 fingers in each hand. So, so it's also a challenge to explain 
how to generate value in this high environment. That's interesting, though, because I, I, I think that, yeah, I'm, tr I'm trying to get into, so I don't know if you remember that, but before I joined Dantra, you and I actually met, and, and I, I must admit, that was in the first period. So when Yair pitched me the idea, I was like, listen, it was more than two years ago, it was like, I, I don't know what we can do with it. And, and I think it's fascinating to see how the, you could imagine the word um, will move forward and, and the technology will be ripe and, and ready for you know, mass usage. And, um, and I think you know, that's one of the things that, that I think every founder um, should take is, is you know, the ability to imagine the word forward, right? Is that's, it's not that, not, a, not that easy, I guess. So, so we have a movie, um, um, a company movie of uh, two and a half years old, where you see someone uh, speak with a computer and uh, ask him to generate a visual and to move the visual to that direction and to that direction. And yesterday, one of the uh, researchers told me, let's take the new uh, chat, uh, GPT chat and, and uh, add it to the platform. And this is basically the movie. Basically, this is what, exactly what we show the movie. The thing that I learned is that it's not enough to imagine how the technology can, where the technology might be and how people are going to use it. You need to very carefully think how it's going to change the world and what are the steps uh, uh, companies will take. Because they will not take the full-blown solution that they want. You need to lead them and so start with something which is more simple. And maybe you need to something which is almost trivial. And then start the conversation and take them step by step. The, the, the way is, is important as much as the end goal here. Super interesting. Thanks, Yair. Um, Itamar, question for you now. Um, so one of the hottest debates around generative AI is, will it replace humans, right? So copywriters, designers, and also developers. And, and as someone who's building a business that um, will use or is using generative AI or generative models um, in the software world, i um, curious to know what is your hypothesis and strategy around it? Are you building tools for... Um, for engineers or try to replace them or replace some of them um, and so um, and how does so I'm curious to know like what are your thoughts and how does it affect your strategy in building a product cool I can talk about philosophy no problem <laughs> so uh, so I think I'll start with Amara law um, it states that we tend to overestimate the effect of technology in the short term and underestimate in the long term and I think that like talking about we're going to replace developers, going to replace uh, designers and writers, etc. It's it's a bit hyped. We just talked about it right now. I mentioned that it's not so easy to to accept the tool. You need to do it step by step. Uh, for example, if you look on uh, Copilot, it suggests developers the next few lines, and not to replace the developers. So the imagination of uh, we're going to replace so many uh, people in the, in the next one or two years, I'm not sure about that. I think we're overestimating it. At the same time, I think a lot of jobs jobs are going to change. Like I don't know if it's ten years or maybe maybe faster because the technology is moving really fast. But let's say ten, fifteen years, things are going to shift and uh, and change. Uh, I developed websites on the '90s, and uh, things are very very different today when you can use cloud. So it's not the only technology that changed uh, changed jobs. Here it could be. <laughs> that many more jobs are going to uh, need to evolve. So, so that's about that. Um, I think that when you're building a, a solution now based on generative models, you, you can think of, OK, let's classify it towards I want to replace someone or I want to enhance someone. And I don't think, like, uh, generally, I think you should think about two things. First is ethical, et cetera. I, I want to I wanna throw that. <laughs> and the second thing is like on the business, and uh, I would consider the both. So first, um, some, some uh, products might put other businesses um, out of business, and that's one thing, or it could actually uh, put a whole industry or, or a job out of business, right? And it happened not only with generative AI, to some extent, maybe we can say about, about Uber, and maybe you want to think about ways uh, where you can help 
the transition with, with your product. Um, for example, you can try to replace the developers or you can try to make the developers more efficient or enable more people to become developers. And, and that's uh, on, on the ethical side, you, you can actually relate and choose what, what you want to do. And, and for the business side, I think it's, it's per, per case and uh, there's something that need to be disrupted and if there is a huge inefficiency and you can actually replace someone, then you can think about it. But I think like uh, in many cases, it's hard to do a transition so fast in most cases and, and I relate back to what Jair said. So I would specifically suggest to try to um, enhance or empower a certain, for a certain job role and actually maybe in addition, enable more people to, to go into that job. So for example, we're building uh, technology to help with code integrity. That is to make sure the code the developers write work as they intended, logically. And we can help developers to, to write their code and make sure that it works better. We ha can help the QA and the testers to do more, uh, to help them in, in areas that uh, go deeper into the code, maybe they uh, could have done, bef could have done, could have not done before. So we're not aiming to replace them. As the technology and the products get better and better, <laughs> who knows what will happen? Okay, so I, I don't know what in ten years. I'm sure that things will will evolve to, uh, even with our product to to like changing roles, etc. And I'm relating back to uh, when I was a web developer in the '90s. Um, so. You could do a few things with GeoCities, if, if anybody remember that, and things like that, and uh, <laughs> people are, and there is different things that you, you can do right now with uh, AWS or GCP or et cetera, so, so things will, will evolve. I agree. I think, I think one of the um, things that I like when, when I you know, discuss it, uh, generative AI, because a lot of times people say like it, it still can't replace humans. And, and my line of thinking is that I don't need it to replace humans. I need it to replace other products that don't work well because they don't have AI. They don't have generative feature in their core. So I think that's, that's the big difference, at least when I look at it. I'm not looking for uh, to replace humans. I'm really just looking for, to replace other products. And, and I think that there's you know, a lot of interesting things that can happen. Yeah, in the short term, I totally agree. But uh, if, if we want to go to a calyptic part, just to... So I think like the people that uh, had a lot in making electricity a commodity uh, at the, the first days, I'm not sure they could imagine what's going to be done uh, with electricity, what humanity is going to achieve with that, and how many jobs changed and shifted. So, so I think for, for the short term, short term, definitely like empower people. That's my, my suggestion. Uh, but I uh, eventually, uh, like we said in the beginning, I think that technology is so powerful, like so meaningful, that uh, helps people to generate. It's part of our essence. I think let differentiate differentiate us, right? As as people that we are creating stuff and and having AI doing that probably uh, will eventually like make some uh, some jobs uh, change dramatically or disappear. Can I, can I add? Sure. Yeah, I think it also raises the question whether these models will be able uh, to be creative. Uh, which is something uh, that we human uh, can do, but um, how can they create something from scratch or you know um, um, develop something, some concept or some ideas that uh, didn't exist in, in the world? And uh, I want to be optimistic to think that, uh, uh, first of all, that it's still not possible, and also that uh, it's a human uh, property that hopefully will, will stay that way. Um, yeah. I actually <laughs> feel a bit different. <laughs> I think that I would say that like one and a half years ago, and now I believe that actually machines are dreaming better than people. Like actually it flipped. Right now uh, the machine is able to dream much quickly and uh, even surprisingly, I think, uh, to so some things that will be hard for uh, one person to sit like and, and imagine and be creative about. And then actually the, our role is to ground, <laughs> to, to ground that imagination and, and tunnel it in towards what we're trying to, to create. Uh, I know it's not contradicting, but, but I, I actually changed my mind about, about uh, their, the possibility of machines being creative. Do you have an example? Evident? Yeah, like <laughs> like you write like, like uh, even even the simple text to text to image when when you write a sentence and you, you get those images, 
and uh, <laughs> that they're really, really creative. And, and of course, uh, you, you, we can claim that this creativity comes from, uh, I don't know, the average or like basically those models are, have like a lot of agent inside them, right? So you actually triggered a kind of an agent, which is a combination of a few people in the world. And, and so you, you, we can cl 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 claim that, but, but still that specific model was able to take just a sentence <laughs> and be so creative about it and offer you so many options. So Yeah, but this is like based on tons of data. It already observed about the, uh, the concept. Uh, it, is, it is amazing and mind-blowing how they can put um, uh, these concept, concepts together in a visually pleasing manner. But there is still a huge gap between creating a new concept in the world that didn't exist, I think. So, for example, there is a chat GPT, but people asking, hey, can you please uh, uh, give me an example where Superman and, uh, and Batman are talking about uh, XG Boost? And then, like, you read that, and, it, and, and, and it's amazing, like, the, the results. So, yeah, we can start, like, like I wouldn't be able to do that and be that creative and 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 you can now claim that I was the one that coming with the request so I'm the one the creative here like Superman and Batman etc but you can go can you think of two fa fictional and, and it will come with results so I still think that it's going to be more and more creative than than we think I think that we're confusing between technical skills and creativity he has the technical skills to write this episode. He has the technical skills to create a, a picture of Superman and Batman doing something, but this is a technical skill. And a good creative guy uh, sitting with this uh, um, application, with this technology, he will be much more efficient, he will be much more faster, but he, he will create something new. If you will try to take all of this thing and create a new episode of Friend, it will be very boring. By the way, is uh, messaging for a company like a, like the tagline of a company, like doing that is considered to be creative, right? And if you write a paragraph and af ask, ask for a messaging for a company, sometimes it's, sorry, fucking amazing. And so that's creative. That's what we people call creative right now. So yeah, I'm, I'm a bit pushing back because I want to be yeah, interesting I, for the... It, it is an interesting, <laughs> it is an interesting topic. Uh, I will say that uh, at least one of the people I spoke with on this topic um, exactly said that even human creativity is not coming out of thin air. It's coming from the large cultural um, um, background that each one has, like the movie, the, the movies they saw, the TV shows they saw, the music they heard, the conversations that they, that they had in the past. And it, when they are being creative, they're actually using the data that they learned in time. All right. So... Um, Listen, uh, in this room and um, in the live broadcast, there, there are a lot of people um, that I know of that, that want to start companies around this thing, around generative AI. And I thought, end this panel with the identical question of asking the four of you, people that um, use these models and busy with them, um, either from the research or from you know, actual building a business around it, um, to give one tip. For, for founders, what would be your, your, your number one advice on how to move forward? Now it's left to right. Now it's left to right, Itamal, that's it. <laughs> okay, so I'll go with uh, kind of a traditional, which, traditional tip that I think fits here as well. Um, we, we have a amazing new hammer, very flexible, right, the generative AI. And uh, uh, I think it's still true. Uh, not to try to find uh, a place to use the hammer, rather uh, like f start with the problem, start with uh, problems that you think should be solved, uh, inefficiencies, uh, things you want to change in, in the world. And if it happened to be <laughs> that generative AI could make a very big impact, generative models could help to change something there, uh, could fit, then, then I, I think you, you know, this, this is a way to, to think about it. Um, so you, you can try like, um, think of a few problems, because you're so, I don't know, excited about generative AI, then think about uh, a few problems and then see if one of them um, uh, can, can be changed meaningfully. Uh, but but it's, it's, it might sound delicate, but it's a very <coughs> big difference than, okay, uh, I wanted to use generative AI, now let's uh, look 
where I can use it, rather let's find a meaningful problem that we can make a business uh, in it, etc., and then see if General AI could fit. Why? Why do you want to do that? Because maybe uh, you know there there uh, there is a new technology that that's coming uh, for that would be useful for, for that problem. And you don't want to be like captivated in, in uh, using generative AI for, for that problem. Uh, when you're building a business, you're trying to solve a problem, and, and you want to know, use the, the tools that you can use uh, for, to do that. So that, that it's, might sound the same, but it's very different. I will, I will continue the same uh, line of thought. Find a problem, see if this hammer can help you, and keep in mind that there are more tools in the, in the toolbox that you can use. It's never one technology, it's never one algorithm. Um, and don't limit yourself to, to, to only generative AI because this is amazing. Uh, so that will be my first advice. My second advice will be um, be very, uh, um, um, when you look on this tool, when you look on this uh, um, uh, um, generative AI capabilities, and it's, no, it's, it's not important if you look at that on the, um, uh, visual side or the tech side, understand exactly what it can do and what it cannot do. What is a promise and what it can do now? Because again, it's a mind-blowing technology and people are easily confused between the promise and between what is actually uh, um, uh, exists today. I will, I will give example. Somebody came to me and showed me how he can train a, a, a system and how he can uh, um, create any product in any setup, but the logo was not right. The logo was not right. The, the, the retailer will never let you to change even one pixel of the logo. And if you cannot do that, then you don't use the right tool. And this is something that you need to be very careful when you choose the problem and the tools you're going to use. Thank you. Yeah, so again, I'm, uh, I never started a company, <laughs> so I'm not sure you should uh, listen to me. Uh, but um, just uh, from a researcher perspective, we, we work in a very crowded area, and it seems that you know, probably also um, companies, industry will get very crowded. So at least f I'm trying to, to, to uh, think of new problems. Uh, like don't do what everyone else is doing. Try to find a unique a unique uh, problem, a, a unique connection, and interdisciplinary uh, a, a use of technology. Just don't do what everyone is, uh, is doing. And I, I also think that uh, related to what Yairi said, it also something that I try to tell the student, is that we always need to uh, strive to understand limitations, failures, uh, and not get blind by uh, uh, you know, what now seems like um, um, yeah, magic, basically uh, black magic. So um, it's not perfect. Uh, there are lots of uh, real world use case that these models cannot handle. And I think it's very important to understand the extent and limits uh, of these models. Yeah. So I'll say a couple of things. Uh, first of all, what my colleague said is that colleagues said is absolutely right. Um, don't you shouldn't start with a solution. You start with should start with the problem. The first thing I want to say. Second thing I want to say is I've never done that, uh, uh, which is not to say it, it's the right thing. I'm just reporting the facts. Um, I, you know, uh, the question is what drives you, what what you're passionate about, and it's not worth doing something you're not passionate about. So if you're passionate about uh, solving the efficient the inefficiency of transportation in urban areas, go and start Uber. Uh, it's a good thing. Um, if you're passionate about uh, changing AI, you know, start AI21 Labs. It's, it's just what drives you. Um, and so um, I, think, I think there are multi multiple paths. Um, I think, the, uh, now speaking specifically about gender of AI, it's a new term. The subject is not new, right? We spoke about natural language generation and natural, la natural language understanding as the yin and yang for a long time. What's happened now, first technology has evolved and now we have packaging that makes it available to you know, your mom uh, to play with. And so now it's become a household term, but the topic isn't new. Um, I would say that if you find that you do want to 
uh, dive into, maybe you have, generative AI, um, I would keep in mind uh, a, a geometric picture. Because what, what's seductive about automatic generation of content? It's the idea of getting something for nothing, right? You, uh, you put in a, a couple of words, and you get an image that's worth a thousand words, right? And so that's, and, and the image is beautiful and magical and relevant. Um, but think, so think of it as, a, a, you, know, uh, you know, starting something small and, a, a, you know, something uh, very large is generated. That's the promise. Uh, but, um, but, but, but here's the rub. The two senses of large. First of all is how much is generated, a thousand words versus a few words. But there's also the search space. How much could have been generated? When you type into Dali, you know, uh, you know a picture of uh, a donkey reading Tolstoy on the moon, um, there are many, many pictures that correspond to it. But mi there are many pictures, so there are many pictures that would satisfy your need here. And so um, it's still magical that it happens. All of us are blown away. But... We didn't have a very specific need. So the target we're aiming at is very large. And so there are many things we could, we could, we could hit that satisfy our need. So as you're trying to do something that's creative, generate a, a picture of a donkey, or write a fantastical story, or like you saw, Amazon has automatic generation of children's stories now. Um, there's not like one right thing, so long as it's kind of the neighborhood and it makes sense uh, and it uses the right tone, not offensive, it's good. There are many such things. Most applications don't have that characteristic. Most of them are uh, have a much narrower target you have to uh, have to have, have to have to hit. And the generative technologies today, in particular, the textual ones, the ones that I deal with, the image I have less of a sense for. Um, aren't that precise. And so you need to be realistic, going back to what you said at the beginning is that, and you said that these technologies are, 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 are amazing, but flawed. So to the extent that you are trying to hit a, a narrow target, make sure that you're giving the right guidance. First of all, for example, you're not trying to generate too much in one fell swoop. Uh, if you're trying to generate a whole document that's very hard if you're trying to generate a word or a sentence or a paragraph that's easier and so just think about that and in general whatever you're generating whatever scope put in place the right guard guardrails and guide and, and and guidelines and kind of you know bias for the system when it does the inference uh when it does the decoding to generate the stuff that kind of close to what you had in mind anyway Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Faye, do we still have time for Q&A from the audience? All right, so maybe if there's someone with a question, we have a few minutes then. Um, yeah, so just, um, do you have a mic for them? Everyone, you want to come over here? Oh, okay. Mics are going to be on. And also for those on Zoom, please send your questions into the Q&A box in the Zoom, and we'll be able to read them out for the audience uh, and for the panelists. Just stand up here if you ask, have a question because we want the Zoom to hear as well. Thank you all, first of all. So I want to talk about the process of creating a company. Um, let's talk about the problems. I, I assume most of the people who are entrepreneur and we're thinking about what is the problem of creating a company. Let's take, for example, the, the labeling issue or the, the, the image annotation. It's something that we saw a lot of companies help with this process. Do you think about other problems that we can tackle or maybe help a AI company or, or training the models uh, that's taken outside, taken to uh, another company that's helped you? Great. So I, I want to could continue what you have, you have said because I think it actually kind of answers you. I think like if you choose, uh, like I'm, I think I'm even almost uh, combining a lot of things that we said in order to answer you. I think that if you're thinking of specific problems, specific vertical that you want to help with, you want to provide a solution with, you need to have the expertise 
uh, in the solution in the in the in the problem space in order to put the the, the guardrails and and, and uh, sorry and you need a passion of course the passion is obvious I don't go to be an entrepreneur that's like given <laughs> and uh, and so, so I need I think you you need to to be able to put uh, put the guardrails you need to be able to guide the the generative models in order to provide uh, a solution within the acceptable space. If it's a problem that allows us a wide one, great. If it's a problem that allows a very narrow one, like ours, we're trying to <coughs> increase integrity to code. So it's very narrow. You need to be to specialize. And then, and then I'm com coming to an answer you, and then how could you be able to put these guardrails? Do you need to collect data uh, up front? Can you do? Can you ask the user to provide that input, and you you will specialize on uh, asking that question or analyzing that person code or um, I don't know database or or whatever. So so I think that th this is the framework, and uh, whether to go and start labeling yourself, uh, it could be um, a must or it could be not. If you have some specialty that you come up front um, from your team or or yourself. And 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 then I also want to consider the the, uh, the the question that should you train your own model? So in my opinion, there uh, there are not many AI twenty ones. You have and, and the company is very special. And uh, and I think like as an entrepreneur, uh, I would suggest actually to start uh, s seeing if you can use an open source or a, a model from uh, AI twenty one or uh, OpenAI etc. And then uh, conquer the, the sub market or the market that, that you want to to lead, and and then think of building your own model. Sorry. So for example, there there is a that's a timing I think that you relate to, um, and and I think like there is there is news right now that I am sure that everyone knows about Jasper AI, right? So there is news that they're starting to train their own model, if not already doing that, but they started with OpenAI, right? So uh, uh, that that's uh, elaborated uh, answer for you. Fantastic, thank you. you. Another question? Yes. Uh, I think mostly targeting uh, you have, I kind of want to continue your last uh, thought about the need and how specific <coughs> is the need uh, when developing an AI model. And I agree, like donkey on uh, reading uh, poetry is, is, is great, but when you have a spef very specific need, like I don't get the results that I want. And I played with AI 21, I played with AI, I played with uh, Dali. And I wonder, and eventually when I go, I try to go to models, and you, you have like lots of parameters to tune and try to tune to get the results that you need. And my question to you is like, when you look at AI, eventually you had a new profession that came up, the data scientist, that knew how to handle all this model, knew how to handle all these parameters. Do you feel that this will be the future also for generative AI? That it will be like a very superficial, like commodity AI, but then, like a data scientist for generative AI? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think it would be a little uh, like feature engineering for machine learning that we saw, you know, 10 and 20 years ago. Uh, you know, it really matters if you're doing kind of classification learning or whatever, what, what the feature you're using. Some are much more, uh, carry much more information than others. Uh, so right now, prompt engineering and things like that are a similar black art, and uh, um, I think that will uh, that will be um, professionalized, uh, and um, I won't. I don't think it will remain a, a black art for a long time. Uh, I think. I think right now the language models are a very blunt tool, and I think they'll become much better honed. Um, right now, I think. So here's what I think. Right now, we have all these uh, little Henry Fords, like us, going, say, we have this engine, buy our engine. And we have customers like maybe you saying, oh, I've heard about engines. They're really good. Um, what do I do? It doesn't match what I need. And there's a gap there. And I think we're in that stage of the industry where it's very exploratory on, on both sides. And I think within two years, which may not solve your problem, but within two years, the services you'll get from the language models, we, we probably won't even call them language models, uh, will be much higher level and, and fine-tuned to your needs, uh, and, um, and, and the market will understand the needs better. Um, fine-tuning right now is not very fine. It's a very blunt instrument also. I think that also is something that you'll see a lot of progress on. 
I have a feeling I didn't answer your question as crisply as I would have liked to, so maybe we can talk about it later on. Hey, um, what might be a surprising technical challenge in building like a generative product that you know no one might think before actually doing it? Uh, no, but uh, that's, a, that's a good suggestion. I, th I think I, I, will follow, I will follow you up. Uh, when deep learning uh, uh, started, we talked about uh, black magic, and, and, uh, and I think that we participate in a workshop called The Art of, uh, Bla uh, the Art of Training uh, Deep Learning Using Black Magic or something like that. And a few years after that, we have tools and we have the understanding how to do that, and we even understand some of the math behind the scene. All of these things are not <laughs> existing in, in, a, in a generative uh, AI yet. Uh, between uh, your have engine and the needs, there is a, a world of tools, um, ML tools, DevOps tools, um, 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 operational tools, how to do the fine tuning, how to run it efficiently on the cloud, how to do that predictable, which are missing. And, and I think that one jump might be when these uh, elements will be much more controllable, much more predictable. The, the geometry that you have uh, uh, described will be, I, I know where, where, where I can land when I do something. And that will be surprising for me. Just as an anecdote, I came across the new acronym. So we, we know MLOps. <laughs> But I saw uh, the acronym LLM ops now. I think it's actually a good a good term. Yeah. LLM large language model ops. I think it's a nice term. Anyway, fantastic. Thank you. So. This is a question from Zoom. How concerned should founders be of cannibalization due to the many models and technologies becoming essentially commodities over time? Won't everything you do become obsolete in about two years due to the fast-paced research? And because this technology is moving, moving so fast, what aspects do you think founders can rely on and assume will advance versus what aspects do you think are not clear and everyone should watch and wait? So it's a combination of a few questions that were asked on Zoom. It's a good question. It's a complicated one. <laughs> so to answer the first question, uh, in my opinion, is very. The question was, how concerned should they be? Um, it's, this is an area that you have to run to stay in place, uh, whether it's in the actual models you're building or the applications around them. I think um, it's probably true that what we view today as large language models will be a commodity, um, except we'll have different animals that aren't these very flat statistical engines that predict the next token um, that will be differentiated. Um, I think, I think at the core of the question are there two questions is, what are firm foundations you can rely on so that you're not building on something that will be obsolete? And what value can you create that will be uh, differentiated in a durable way over time? Um, I think in terms of the foundations you're building on, you have to assume that the large language model you're using today will not be the one you're using a year from now, and certainly not two years from now. That's a given. If you're not comfortable with that premise, you shouldn't be in this business. In terms of the value, the biggest value is actually understanding the nail. You were building this hammer to the extent that you're understanding where you're aiming it at, and by the way, accumulating data that's unique to you, so you have this flywheel that optimizes things I think that's a moat that's to focus on. Ten years ago, so many companies, so many um, academia, so many giants like um, AWS, etc., had a huge effort on an ML and recognition and uh, uh, machine learning capabilities trying to commoditize this field. And it didn't commoditize that fast. Uh, that still there is a, a room for computer vision researcher. There's still a room for computer vision companies 
maybe they will find the niche which is not uh, um, the very simple recognition task but they try to recognize something specifically but they still have a room for that and I think that it's the same with generative AI it's, it's, it's ML it's the next generation of ML it will be similar in a way you will need to run fast you will need to make sure that you always uh, update with the state of the art and you need to find what how you are the best one in the world that, that solve the problem you, you aim to solve. Hey everyone. <clears throat> so right now it seems that the generative uh, AI field is going in the direction of uh, kind of a cold war. Every company with a lot of resources uh, taking uh, the capitalist approach and bigger, bigger models, more parameters, bigger data sets, better performance. So training for Scratch is impossible for a new startup. Even though uh, ChatGPT or GPT-3 or OpenAI will provide us their services uh, for commercial use, uh, even if it will cost us like a cent for a sentence, which is quite decent price uh, for these abilities, a new startup that need to train on million, millions of sentences need a lot of uh, founding to do this. So if I want to create a startup right now, I can create from scratch. I'm understanding the technology, but I'm also can't, uh, I, I can't afford myself paying million, millions of dollars uh, to a company and also to be depends on the third side uh, while my startup is uh, running. So how do you think that the future for startups uh, would be look like um, when utilizing these uh, powerful tools? Cool. I'll try to relate to all three questions at once. Sorry about it. I think it's quite surprising uh, how um, the models today are not so good with handling like local memory. What happened right now? You, you, you train it on, until 2021, and then what about what happened last month? And you try to provide that uh, through uh, a prompting or something like that and make it up to date. And, and that's not easy to, to make these model like uh, re relate to, to, to a prompt as you want it, and especially if, if the, there is a lot of content related to, to that. So that re relates to the question that uh, what, what's maybe surprising or, or, or challenging, and, and, but this is also the, the opportunity that the, if, if you are able to provide a lot of right tem like current context, the right context to, to a foundation model that is specific uh, for your use case and specific for your challenge, that's a lot of uh, value that you can create and, and uh, gain your uh, own, uh, let's say, um, defensibility uh, b because the models, models today are really good to, to be able to have a universal presentation, but you need to know how to prompt them in order to, and with the, with the guardrails in order to bring you the solution or the answer that you want. So, so to come and answering uh, your question, I think that if the product you're trying to build uh, is like almost completely building upon an existing model that all, all you need to do is like ask uh, something simple and get an answer and that's your product, you're in a problem. But if there is a solution around a foundation model of creating the right context for the model, which requires a certain UX UI, requires certain technologies, etc., and the cross-processing after the model, model, for example, is complicated to some, to some extent, then I think that basically the model is another um, another block in your technology, uh, same as, I don't know, uh, uh, Elasticsearch or whatever, although it's much more magical, etc. and, and uh, there is a why now that to build a solution. And then one day, when you are powerful enough and you have enough, enough budget, you can consider if you want to keep using that or, or building uh, yourself. So the TLDR is that if your product is so simple that you, you do you're, you're, all you do is ask a model and get a result in a very simple way. Then probably it's not a good good uh, um, n n not a good business, and you will have defensibility problem, etc. The fact that there is a, um, a, a, a how you call it arm cold war cold war it maybe it's like this. It's good for you. 
It's actually opportunity. It means that if you develop the right tool, someone <coughs> will use it. There is a lot of activity. There is a lot of, uh, a lot of going on. Industries are shaping differently, and this is exactly the room for startup to plug in and to do new stuff. It's good for you. Uh, two okay. more questions from Zoom, and then we have our last question here before we're wrapping it up. Question one, market dynamics of generative AI will be dominated by big companies or led by developers who build on foundational models? We're kind of seeing this scope, and that could be for any one of you. And then specifically for Near, are there specific verticals that VCs are looking for to invest in when it comes to generative AI? Art, sales, productivity, music, marketing, et cetera. Um, so we can open up the first question to everyone, and then the question second to you. Maybe I'll start with the second one, just because it um, um, sits in my head for a while. Um, um, the three guidelines, like the main main three guidelines that I have when, when I look at generative AI companies are things that actually were said in this panel. Um, the first one is um, we're obviously not looking to invest in trivial solutions, and you would be surprised um, just how much people you know see the technology, see the magic, and and go to the obvious places of uh, helping content creators create content, right? So um, the first thing is is to really find a problem that is not related to generative AI, and and, and it's a, a, a real problem, and it's big, and it will stay a problem in the next 20 years. So so that's the first thing. The second thing is that um, we're really lot not in the business of um, taking the result from one of the large models and wrap it and serve it to the end user. That's really um, not, not a business model that we would back. Um, it's very hard to differentiate yourself. There will be a million of competitors and uh, extremely hard to, um, to build a big company like that. So, so we're, when we're thinking about it, we're, we're looking for a product that contains a, a variety of, of elements, right? So there's a little bit of, of generative magic, but there's also good engineering product work that relates to the specific problem that, that you're trying to solve. And maybe maybe you could build a, a really good company in this problem with this tech without the generative at all. So it's not like we must see that uh, the face of the, of, the solution, of the solution is generative. Um, and the third thing is that, and this is why we also call this uh, the panel uh, building to last. Uh, one of the things that we're concerned of, as, as, as many other founders, is that every week, every you know, every day, there's a new like there's a, a new product, there's a new innovation in this world, and and so we're looking for companies that would um, benefit from the advancement in the market. So if they if there are more models, if there are more applications, if there are, are more ways you can um, give a prompt to the machine and get something back then the value of your startup is actually growing because it's not closely tied to one specific algorithm and just do something with it. So these three, so not go to trivial places, um, um, not, the, not to, uh, build your entire solution around generative AI and, and make it you know, benefit from the advancement in technology in the next few years, that's I think the three main things that I'm looking for. So that was the second question. I forgot what's the first one. <laughs> what about market dynamics? I think that uh, I divide into producers and consumers of technology, specifically gender of AI. Um, on the producers, I think it's not a winner take all, but it's a few take all. I think it'll be a small number of companies in the space. Uh, they include the large companies, but I think the uh, smaller but large companies, let's say, for example, OpenAI, uh, and hopefully we too, will, uh, but there'll be a handful of such companies that will, uh, I think, provide the technology. Uh, I think that um, in terms of the consumers of technology, I think it'll be everywhere, and I divide it in, into two parts. Uh, traditional companies that want to modernize, you know, a CPG company or something that wants to now really... Um, um, you know, uh, have an edge by doing customer, you know, service or something with uh, AI. 
uh, and companies whose very premise is the opportunities provided by the technology, either new applications that weren't uh, uh, possible before or uh, uh, applications that can be redone, rethought much better because of technology. But I think that's all over the place. There'll be thousands and thousands of such application uh, companies. Thank you. That's it. Um, yeah, dear panelists, thank you so much for uh, spending this morning with us. Um, <laughs>